Good evening, and welcome to Post Apoc Horse Talk. I'm your host, Gallant Aegis, and this is my co-host, BG. Say hello, BG. Wonderful evening to all. Hello. All right. Before we go on tonight, normal spiel. To avoid cluttering and to be more expedient later, if you could ask any questions ju- during the show, BG will compile them in for a Q&A at the end. Now, our guest tonight is one of the mod leads of a very promising looking uh, sub mod of a sub mod of a sub mod of a sub mod of an entirely different mod. Please welcome onto the show the laundry. Hello. So, how are you enjoying it, uh, coming onto the show already? Um, well, considering we've been here, um, we've been live less than a minute it's been pretty good yes great opening fantastic so let's get right into the meat and potatoes then first question of the night so this is the first time you've had a mod author on perhaps you could tell us about your work on uh your sub mod bellfire blues uh, for those who don't know bellfire blues is a hoi four sub mod in Fall to Equestria, based off the engines of both uh, Old World Blues, which is a Fallout sub-mod, and Equestria at War, which is, as the name would suggest, a Horse World uh, Hoi 4 mod. Yeah, so um, pretty much uh, Equestria at War and Old World Blues, um, two of the like most expansive and pretty much replace nearly everything about base parts of parts of iron four which is a um world war ii strategy game uh by paradox interactive um balefire blues aims to uh combine both of those mods in like um i guess functionality and uh, also replace some of their stuff. Like um, we have in Old World Blues, they have like a larger version of North America with navigable rivers as their map. Um, we took the equestrian continent from Equestria at War, scaled it up, gave it navigable rivers, new map, everything. But and so pretty much. Uh, Old War Blues fied um, EAW's map and created uh, Balefire Blues on top of that. And uh, we've added some new systems and uh, new nations to play as. Uh, lots from uh, Fallout Equestria, like Red Eye and the Enclave and steel rangers and such and uh some that we have completely created on our own i think we're having some technical difficulty difficulties Uh oh yeah i think your internet connection is cutting out a little bit there that's not that's not good um We do apologize for this. Uh, good time to put in some lift music. Shame I don't have any. Elevator music. Yes. Uh, seems that the issue has corrected itself. Uh, could you for repeating the last thing you tried to say before we had some technical difficulties? Yeah, I'll uh, try and sum it up quickly. So, um, Balefire Blues aims to combine uh, the features of Old War Blues, the like you said, Fallout mod, and Equestria at War, uh, the My Little Pony mod for Hearts of Iron 4, a 
uh, World War II real-time strategy strategy game by Paradox Interactive. Um, Old War Blues, uh, they've created a map of North America with navigable rivers, uh, made pretty much that the whole map, made it larger. Um, we've done that process to the equestrian continent in from the equestrian war and um, gave made that larger and gave it navigable rivers and built uh, our mod Balefire Blues off of that. And uh, we've uh, created different countries for people to play as. Um, some you'll recognize from uh, Fallout Equestria, uh, like Red Eye and the Enclave and or Steel Rangers, and some that we've created entirely from our problem. Okay. Perhaps you could also tell us how you got into the modding scene and by extension, how did you get into making a mod of Hoi 4? Um, well, I've told this story a couple times, um, but never over voice. Um, so, uh, out, I guess June of last year, I uh, decided, hey, I consider myself an all right writer. Why don't I write a Fallout Equestria side fic? Uh, I got about two and a half chapters in writing it and realized, oh, I'm not actually that good of a writer. Um, so that was scrapped. Then I realized um, something I can do is uh, I know the basics of coding. And uh, so I just jumped into Hard Spiron 4 coding because uh, I played Equestria at War quite a lot and World War Blues to a lesser extent. But uh, so I just started from there. And that really was my first experience modding. I'd done a couple stuff before it, but nothing to this scale. Uh, I don't think anyone has really done it to this scale, uh, trying to combine two such expansive mods together and creating something new out of those. Okay. Uh, so how did you actually end up moving from wanting in your head to make an FOE mod to actually doing it? What actually was the instigating factor for you? Well, uh, I was out of school over the time for summer break. Um, I really didn't have anything better to do. Like, um, I was away from home. And, uh, I couldn't spend any time with friends, So, but I had my laptop with me. Um, so I just started working on uh, the map was what I really started on first. I knew I wanted a, a larger version of Equestria and that, that in itself took, I guess, a month and a half, two months to finish. Well, and it's, I don't consider it finished even now. Um, I guess month and a half, two months is a better time for it to get functional. It uh, took quite a lot of time and a quite a few uh, banging my head against a table to get it to work. Hmm. Well, better it takes long and longer and you've actually got something to present than trying to rush it and not having anything to show for it. Definitely, yeah. And I have every confidence that you'll produce a quality product. Well, I sure hope so. I mean, I've been keeping track of it as soon as I was aware that this was a mod. And, yeah, I've been really interested in all the developments and all the little teasers you've been dropping. So, that being said, seeing as your mod is working with both Old World Blues and Equestria at War for features... Has the two very different mods in both feel and tone 
brought up any kind of particular unique problems? Anything mechanically uh, speaking? Certainly. Um, the question at war is more of World War II in the My Little Pony universe, while Old World Blues is Fallout in a World War II game, which uh, are drastically different, like, especially uh, the best example is in terms of population. Oh, yeah. So many people have died over the course of the 200 years that take place between uh, World War II and the time of Fallout. So I think the total number for their population in Old World Blues right now is only like 3 million, I would say. That's um, barely, that's barely the population yeah. of a very small country. Some cities yeah. have more people than that nowadays. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a bigger population than Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Equestria at War, uh, I'll just use the country of Equestria, for example. They start out with 50 million, certainly less than uh, real world numbers around that time, but still far, far more than uh, Old World Blues. So a lot of it has been trying to get some of the uh, EAW mechanics to work with such a lower population numbers for the game to register that. Um, thankfully, uh, Old War Blues has solved a lot of those problems on their own, and by virtue of us being a uh, sub-mod of them, um, we get to use those uh, fixes that they've done. Hmm. All right. Well, let us move on to the next question then, if you'll bear me with a second. This is going to be probably the biggest question of this opening part. What is considered canon for Burl Fire Blues? Because well, this is a this is going to be a, a lovely kettle of worms to open up. Yeah, you're right about it being a can of worms. Um, it's something I've had in mind since the very start. Um, so, the unchangeable facts is the original uh, Fallout Equestria story. Um, other than some of the time spans it takes place, because in the original story, uh, Little Pip only it only takes place over two months, yeah. which is pr nothing in terms of uh, gameplay time. Oh yeah, that's tiny and like high, yeah, tiny in Hearts of Iron times. That, that can fly past in what like that two yeah, months. Like it literally takes on only on the lowest speed. It only takes I would say like five minutes to go through. Um. But so we've had to uh, extend uh, the story of it out drastically. So from two months to uh, five years. So you actually have stuff to play. Um, but none of the facts change. Um, it's all the same. From uh, original Fallout Equestria is the baseline. Nothing can change in that. We bend everything else around that and create stuff off of that that doesn't affect it. Um, for example, we use uh, quite a bit of Questry at War Cannon too, just to fill in the gaps because there are quite a lot of gaps left by the original story. Like they only touch on a tiny fraction of the wasteland. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a fair point. Like, um, for example, in uh, one of the later updates we're going to have uh, at the Southeast Equestria, that's... The jungle and the swamps there. Yeah, the jungles and the swamps. Uh, in Equestria at War, um, that's where uh, most of the uh, Thestral Bat Ponies live. And mm. It's also where much of like, the mystifistical stuff lives. 
yeah, like uh, Daring Do, Ali Zodal, that sort of thing. But another thing that takes place in that area is uh, the other story by KCAT, which um, is considered semi-canon to Fallout Equestria. It's written in the universe, but isn't canon. But we are going to take it as canon. Um, basically, in that story, it tells the tale of Darren Do uh, fighting zebras down in the jungles. Um, that Since that doesn't change anything about original Fallout Equestria, we're going to take that and merge it with uh, EAW canon. So, like, the Southeast will have, I admit, uh, the effects of that story by KCAT, um, but also EAW in it, too. Um, another touchy example is uh, Project Horizons. Oh, boy! We're going to bring up Project Horizons again! Yeah. This, this part will be fun. Um, there's a difference between my opinion of Project Horizons and what's going to go into the mod. In my opinion of Project Horizons, nothing past Chapter 16 is worth reading. Um, I mean, let's be fair. Like, the, most of it isn't great. There, there is yeah. some good stuff in there, ain't gonna lie. There, there's some good stuff, yeah. But um, it, it goes off the rails after that. Um, but we're taking out some of the uh, more esoteric stuff. So there's not going to be a, a giant star lich that's a big old rock under the city. That's going to be gone. because That seems more than fair because that stuff is... Um, that That's some universe-bending nonsense right there. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the titular project, Project Horizons, will also be gone since it has to do with the mm -hmm. star lich under the city. Like, I don't think you could, I think you probably could still have the rock itself be there. Yeah. But you definitely, it, but, but definitely not be alive or anything nonsensical like yeah. that. Um, Unless you want to include of, that like as a secret path that it's actually alive. Yeah. Uh, doubtful. Um, <laughs> we, we've kind of, there are some things of pH that will not be included. Starlitch being one of them. Um, but, like, a lot of it, there's some really great world building stuff in PH. Like, the Thunderhead um, Navarro split, that's great. I, I eat that stuff up. Um, mm. The various factions of the Hoof, that, like the, the Finders and uh, society and yeah th those are pretty nifty I'm not gonna lie though pretty great when it comes to the enclave stuff basically you can use that uh, whole conflict there as a means to stop the enclave from just steamrolling the wasteland basically force them into a civil war before they can you know go about their business yeah definitely um like and then um so basically with PH, we're cutting out all the esoteric stuff and stuff that bends um, the original lore of Fallout of Equestria. So uh, minor spoilers, but Blackjack does not go to Tin Pony Tower. She doesn't meet, or she can go to Tin Pony Tower, but she doesn't meet Little Pip and they don't have their adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Pinkie Pie's original death stays the same, eh? Yes, yes. That, that has to happen because that because that was yeah. hot garbage. Yeah. Why 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 does just gotta make a side sidetrack. Why does Project Party Pooper exist? Golden Blood angry? Gold Golden Blood got angst for everything. Yeah. Gold Golden Blood got angst for all other living beings? Yeah, really. Um, Golden Blood is a complicated character. Um, I won't. That, that's putting it somewhat now. mildly. Yeah. Um, but uh, touching back on the topic of the original question, um, we also, or I have plans to include the uh, content from the other, I guess you would say, 
major side effects of Fallout Equestria, those being um, uh, Pink Eyes, uh, Murky Number 7, and to a much lesser extent, Heroes, because I I haven't read Heroes, but... Um, the hard I've, part about Heroes is fitting Caledonia into the map. Yeah, see, that's that's where the problem comes in. It doesn't take place in Equestria, so content from it maybe there will be an off reference or two to it but it won't be included in it like not unless you make caledonia be in a different spot and just be that land between like that middle piece of land between the like, cantalot and what would be van hoofer on the map yeah um but i guess i'll touch on murky number seven now since other than the original fic, it's um, the only one that's currently, well, that is going to be included in, that will have content from it in the first release of Veil Fire Blues, uh, since it takes place exclu exclusively in Philadelphia, which is one of the main uh, center points of um, Veil Fire Blues. I imagine it's probably the most uh, interesting place to play as. Uh, yeah, when you play the game. Um, like you've got the pretty much at the start of three-way duel between Red Eye um, kind of like a uh, coalition of sorts between raiders and settlers and such who are only united as to not be enslaved by Red Eye and uh, the Steel Rangers of course. Um, but I've spoken uh, quite a lot with uh, Fuzzy Vivi, the um, author of Murky Number 7, and uh, we've he's, he's helped me hash out some ideas for um, stuff from it, like uh, um, for example, we've uh, already got or I have already um, the basics of a path for a protege to be in it um like he can take control and you can play as his nation um and little events touching on the uh events that take place in uh, murky number seven itself um which tentatively may be written by fuzzy vv himself he's offered but i haven't taken it, him up on it yet um yeah and i guess as for pink eyes, there's um, plans for it to take place in the, like you said, the area between Canterlot and Van Hoover, Van Hoover, whatever it's called, I can't remember off the top of my head, for it to take place in between that, in that area. All right, then. Uh, perhaps taking anything from some of the smaller fix at all, because there's some really good stuff out there. Like, for example, um, I know this is probably going to be a miles and down the road, because, yeah. The zebras. The zebras that are mentioned in Homelands and, to a lesser extent, Project Horizons, I think is one of the good things that came out of Project Horizons. There's some really good stuff there, in my opinion. I like all of the stuff there. Will that perhaps be making an appearance at some point in the not necessarily foreseeable future? Definitely. Uh, zebras are actually already in the mod, but to a uh, not like think of a powerful nation and then take the opposite of that. Um. It, it's um, Glyphmark there. Just Glyphmark? Glyphmark's in it. Uh, it's a shithole. Excuse my French, but yeah, it it's not a good place to live. I imagine um, that probably like an early war goal for Red Eye is just to make it a puppet state or something. Uh, no, actually. Um, but he can get uh, he can get uh, a war goal on it later on, but um, we have plans up in the uh, 
I guess what we, you would call Stalingrad region um, up north by in the uh, city of St. Petershof, all these deliciously punny names, mm -hmm. um, to have the remnants of a zebra army that invaded um, shortly uh, before the bombs fell. And as a result of the zebra army's invasion, St. Petershof was pretty much untouched by the mega spells. Um, Why bomb your own soldiers? Yeah, pretty much. Um, they're one of the few uh, uh, like successful invasions of the... Um, it does raise a question, that... though. If they intended to blow up Equestria, why did they even go ahead with the invasion at that point? Seeing as they were going to blow it up anyway, why even leave your soldiers behind? Just withdraw, blow them up, be done. Well... Honestly, we haven't gotten that far into uh, fleshing out their lore. Um, but I guess I'll try and make some stuff up right here. Um, I would say because St. Peter's Hoof was a valuable city, I would say. Um, it's got maybe some secrets hidden in it that the zebras wanted to secure before the end of the world. Um oh. I've got a message. I mean, the reason I would have given for that is um, perhaps they intended to withdraw on time, but something forced their hoof ahead of time uh, to start blowing up the world, as it were. And they thought to themselves, this is probably going to, we're probably going to have to do this now uh, and then try and withdraw them later. But something happened to the fleet seeing as, you know, Equestria tried to, uh, you know, not be blown up, as it were. Ended up, you know, blowing up their fleet by accident. So they got left behind um, because everyone was blowing each other up. I've gotten a message from one of my uh, other devs who's currently watching the stream. Uh, thank you, Lord Wahoo, for getting me back up to speed with uh, the Stalingrad lore that we've got. Um, the zebra, we've planned it so the zebras didn't actually attack Stalingrad, the Stalingrad area with mega spells. Um, they were attacking the rest of Equestria, but it was actually an equestrian mega spell that backfired and brought death to the whole region. Uh, like ah, I see. That's right. Um, a lot of stuff happened right at the same time that the bombs were falling in Stalingrad. Uh, there was a popular uprising that uh, rebels attacked a military base in the city. Um, that set off the chain of events that um, uh, destroyed the region. Um, there was the zebra invasion, like I said, and of course the whole end of the world sort of thing. Okay, so I'm looking forward to all of this. It's all really very interesting, at least for me. So I, I don't know about the uh, the audience, but at least for my benefit, this has been really enlightening as a conversation. Let's get well, right to that. Uh, before going on some more obligatory questions. Is there any kind of sneaky peek you want to give us about the upcoming release? Um, sure. Uh, if, uh, here, let me find something real quick. We've got quite a bit of stuff in the back burner that um, hasn't been shown at the public. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess something that we haven't talked about um, in quite a while is how little Pip will be handled, how her journey will be handled. Um, last time it was shown on the Discord server uh, for Banfire Blues, it was a beast that I brought upon myself. Um, it was... Yeah, I, I saw that event chain. It yeah, was... Like that was a heckin' long end. I think. Um, and 
it ended up be, I ended up scrapping it because it was like an event every 13 days for the player to choose from. And it was just constant. Like you had to keep pausing the game over and over and over again because you couldn't play the game because you were dealing with all the events. So I cut it down to uh, 45 main events for each chapter um, and then some sub events for some of the more important events like um, the first one you encounter is uh, let me I believe event uh, concerning chapter three of the fic um, guidance where uh, the player can choose um, whether or not little pip uh, actually takes watcher's advice and takes his guidance or just says fuck off to watcher and that can have huge ramifications down the line like if little pip doesn't accept watcher's help she never learns of uh, the gardens of equestria and in turn never learns of the other hope um for the wasteland and that will be the only way if little pip spurns watcher that will be the only way that uh she can actually join red eye at, during um i believe it's the kingdom of the blind event um where red eye tries to form his new unity at the cathedral um and that is cool but you can actually have that path yeah there's uh quite a few paths for red eye um I'm the uh, lead dev for Red Eye, so I can talk for quite a bit on him. Um, you've got, obviously, uh, Red Eye Path featuring Red Eye, who did nothing wrong, by the way. Red um, Eye obviously never did anything wrong. Uh, you, Which eventually leads to um, trying to form the new unity, uh, which you can form if Little Pip meets all the proper requirements to joining Red Eye, or the canonical ending of failing to join the new Unity, which Stern then takes over for very temporarily, and then after Stern leads to a um, as of yet undeveloped uh, path for a protege, where he's uh, pretty much takes over Philadelphia and tries to make it a better place. Tries to reform the place. Yeah. Um, but there's also a uh, way for Red Eye to die very early on. Um, shortly after beating the uh, coalition that I mentioned earlier that he starts out at war with, um, which Pretty, he pretty much always wins that war. Um, there's uh, some event chain. There's a event chain that um, can lead if you uh, drastically mishandle the uh, slave revolt that takes place in an event chain. Um, it can lead to uh, one of two options. Either Red Eye dies and Stern is able to uh, regain control before fallout civil war happens and it leads to a uh, just path for stern and a or a um path where red eye dies and stern is unable to take control and uh, she and her slavers and her talons are all kicked out of the city and a war starts between uh free philadelphia which is slave revolt propped up and, by the steel rangers i imagine uh not exactly uh they're they're kind of on their own. The Steel Rangers are still waiting to see who who wins because uh, they don't really want to uh, make too much of a that much of a um, like investment, I would say, into someone they're not entirely sure that that would win. And is there you know, perhaps a focus for the slaves to convince them to give some nominal help? Yes, there is uh, later on um, after they win. Um, ah, I see. 
bastards. Won't but, even won't even help the winning side. Yeah, really. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be the teaser for now. All right, Peter, did you have any questions? PG, you still here? Huh? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, no. So I was just gonna say, uh, not not so far. Please, uh, please do proceed. Or All actually, right. actually, um, would there eventually, would you eventually see uh, including uh, side fix um, uh, that that might be smaller than you know the 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 well known main five big five. Um, there have been. Well, I have made very very tentative plans in my head to include maybe some of the more popular smaller ones because if we just take like for example one of the fix much smaller fix that I've read. Um, Follow the question, Project Hive. Um, God, it's it's tiny. Um, it has to do with the change lanes. Um, if we were to take lore from that, you probably wouldn't know where it would be from. And it's mostly in turn. We mostly will take stuff from uh, like um, more well-known but not the giant ones like uh the big big side picks um for example um uh one of my other well i guess i would say my uh second in command on the mod um uh, lucas he's um talked with uh, the author of wasteland jewel and um there's going to be content from that in, uh, let me check, the southwest of Equestria. And uh, there may also be references to uh, duck and cover in um, the Trottingham region, of course. Hmm. Um, what about um, Rangers of Winter Trot? That was... In my opinion, actually, a pretty awesome fic just just got dropped. So unfortunately. Um, well, I'm going to be honest. I really haven't read that many Fallout Equestria fics. Like, I still haven't completely finished Murky Number no. Seven. Um, I've only fully finished um, PH. Uh, the original and pink eyes haven't even touched heroes um heroes is really good i highly recommend it we actually had no one on here a couple weeks ago actually and, um, i said a couple weeks ago it was a couple months ago now but thankfully i am in a we're a dev team uh so we're not just relying on my limited knowledge of all the side fix um I have been informed that Rangers of Winter Trot takes place in, uh, like, the north area. Um, uh, and the area where it takes place, we don't have any plans for, so it's possible that content from it, it could be included. All right. Let's move on to our more obligatory questions for the night. How did you get into MLP and then FOE by extension? Well, um, I actually started when I was fairly young. Um, I don't, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird way. I don't know why my younger mind thought that being a brony was a cool thing. So I actually bragged about it, um, even though I wasn't really one. And from that, 
I just kind of started watching the show. Um, and from there, it, I guess, spiraled out of control. Um, my first, the first fan fiction I ever read was um, a uh, Starbound crossover, a game Starbound. It's uh, kind of like Terraria in space. Um, let me see if I can find the name of it. Oh, uh, yeah. Skies of Harmony Starbound by uh, Buster Bleasel. Um, in hindsight, it was just a mediocre fan fiction, not that good, but it was really my first experience with stuff beyond the show. Um, from there, it spiraled even more. Um, I eventually uh, decided well, I was going on a road trip and uh, I decided, you know what? I've heard of this Fallout of crossover. I had actually never even, I knew next to nothing about Fallout before actually reading Fallout Equestria. Um, so I downloaded the uh, Crazed Rambling audiobook. Um, the choice. And just listened to that over the course of my road trip. Um, and that, that, that was that. Um, I just, I set that down for, uh, I think, I guess a year and a half maybe. And then I'm like, maybe I should read, like actually read it this time. So I actually read it uh, on film fiction. Um, and then, then I decided, you know what, I've heard of this other big one in the same universe, uh, something by the name of, what, Project Horizons? Oh, boy. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I read that one all the way through um, in a much shorter time than it, than it should have taken me. Um, I binge read it. Um, then I kind of put it net, put it fall out Equestria back down for a while. Um, then uh, I listened to the audiobook once more, and I after that I uh, read Pink Eyes, which is my favorite uh, fall out Equestria story I've ever read. Um, and then that entered another low point. Didn't really touch it for a while. And I'm like, you know what? Let's go back and I'm having another road trip. Let's listen to another Fallout Equestria story. But not the original one. I've read that one three times. Well, read slash listened to it. Let's do PH again. You did it. You did it to yourself twice. Jesus Christ, yeah, dude! I, do you like to suffer? I, I suffered even more the second time because um, I listened to Visual Pony, the narrator's one, and as you may know, uh, he has a nearly incomprehensibly thick German accent. I mean, it, especially in those earlier chapters. To be it, fair, though, his accent isn't as thick as other Germans that I've heard. Yeah, um, but. Um, I could barely understand him for the first five chapters, and now I've kind of gotten used to it. Um, you, you know what irritates me is the... Um, he is really bad at... Like, he has um, people who listen to his audio before uploading to make sure that he's not making mistakes, but how do they not tell him that you're, not, that you're um, pronouncing the words incorrectly? Like... Look this up, audience, people. He, when Blackjack's up in the Enclave in Thunderhead, spoiler alert, just by the way, he constantly calls this character Chicanery. The guy's name is Chicanery. And it grated on my nerves like nobody's business that he could not pronounce Chicanery. 
yeah, in the very, f- uh, I guess, I can't remember, it was either first or second chapter. Does the first chapter of PH end with uh, them leaving the vault? I think or, so, yeah. Yeah, then it would be the second chapter. It was when they were meeting Watcher, um, I had to pause it for like 15 minutes to figure out that he said bug instead of bag. I don't know why it took me that long, but it was like when they were he was describing the sprite, uh, it was like small metal bag, but in a German accent. Um, I... <laughs> Let's be fair, though. Let's not rag on him too hard. He he yeah, also he, dragged he, himself through the suffering that is PH. He, so let's not be too harsh on him. Right now, is the only one who has actually done a complete audiobook of PH. Which, props to him, he made it all the way through and had to speak those lines. Uh, um, and he's... Once you get past the accent, it's a pretty well put together audiobook. He um, tried. A- apart from yeah. all those like really irritating, can't pronounce English correct moments, it was good enough that I listened to the whole thing, and I don't feel that he did a bad job with it. Yeah, and so me listening to that audiobook was last summer, uh, which you may remember earlier was about the time I decided I wanted to write my own side fic, because I had listened to the... Well, I got about halfway through the Faux or PH um, audiobook. I still haven't finished it. Um, it's still downloaded on my phone, but I don't have... I don't know if I'm going to finish it, but... Um, like... I, I really have a bad case of world-building building, world itis, like... I love world building. It's one of my it's fun pastimes. It's really fun. Um, just the world build, like I mentioned earlier, the world building in PH. Well, the story's not that good, and some of the characters could be better. Um, and less of them could die. Yeah, and uh, there could be less rape of blackjack. There could be um, less. There could be less rape and sexual assault in that fic. Full stop. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It has a really conspicuous focus on that. It it, it seems to try and use um, sexual trauma as an as a uh, a substitute for personality. Yeah, definitely. Um, but like I said, the world building it in it, I'm a sucker for that sort of thing. I enjoyed it, and so I started. I I had actually created a bit of a world, um, I guess, during my second time going back into Fallout Equestria. Never written any story about it. Um, I just had, like, uh, factions and the area and that sort of thing all planned out. Um, I It was a couple years ago, so a lot of it had... Uh, had to go through refinement. Um, so it wasn't terrible. Um, and I still don't think it's super terrible. In fact, uh, no spoilers, but I may want to put some of them into the mod. Um, but, uh, so I decided, you know, I've had this world in Fallout Equestria. I could do. I started started writing and decided it wasn't very good and the rest is history but that's pretty much how i got really into faux balefire blues especially has cemented me into the fandom and we're very welcome for it but anyway let's move on to our next question so from where you are in your ivory tower of this mod that you're producing how healthy do you think the fandom is right now, and where do you think it's going? Specifically at the FOE fandom, rather than the MLP one. Um, well, everything, all, all the sub-fandoms of MLP all spin on the center spoke of, or center pin. They're all spokes of one wheel, um, and the center of that wheel is 
the show and obviously the show has ended um and the mlp fandom has kind of died down in later years and uh as a result so have all the sub fandoms um however i don't think fo has suffered too much from that um like the end of murky number seven wasn't actually that long ago um and like that, that's one of the most celebrated uh, fix of the fandom. And so I don't think it's in any danger of completely going away, but I don't think it will grow too much. Um, maybe it's possible if some new and great fic comes up it can grow a little bit and have a little bit of a renaissance but it's it's no longer the limelight in the in the limelight um and yeah that's i'd be inclined to agree with you yeah sorry carry on though uh i might be a bit biased but i think uh from just from what I've seen with like in terms of fix um, and other developments like um, the Overmare Studios, uh, their game. Um, I do need to pick up that one when it's uh, as far as I'm aware, it isn't it, available yet. It's got a couple demos of it, um, and it's been in development for quite a long time. Um, it's it, I feel like it stagnated for a while. It's kind of hit its uh, second leg now. Um, it's coming back into stride. Uh, they're getting quite a bit done on it. Um, pretty impressive with the stuff they've got. Um, but, like I said, might be biased. I think uh, Balefire Blues is probably one of the biggest and most fast-moving projects of the fandom right now. Um, and here comes the bias. Um, I think one of the highest quality fast-moving ones right now. Don't put yourself too high on that pedestal there, friend. Look, I'm just saying, um, the vast majority of side fix uh, are not that good. Granted. Um, and I'm one of the uh, weirdos. I don't consider the original fic to be that good either. It's got a quite a bit of uh, good points to it. Um, again, I'm a sucker for world building, um, but I kind of hold contra- contra- controversial opinions about it. Um, I don't really like Little Pip as a character. I despise Velvet Remedy. I, I mean, if you Lamdy. If you like Lamity that kind of stuff, words. you should see our um, Hearthswarming special. You'll you'll absolutely love that, our Hearthswarming special. I guess I'll have to check it out. Um, Calamity and Steel Hooves are really the only two main characters I like. Red Eye is one of the few characters in the story with actual depth. And especially in the later parts of the story, it, it really just becomes... All the names and world building stuff just become rips from... Um, like actual fallout uh like ncr new canterlot republic i despise that and i know quite a few of my members of the mod team despise it too that first off they don't even hold canterlot um but it's they try kcat tries to do it or tries to make sense of it it doesn't really work um but yeah, uh, I PH obviously you know it's it's got its flaws. So does Murky Number Seven, and like I said, but really the only like truly great fic that I have read from Fallout Equestria is Pink Eyes. Fun fact: we're prob- we're trying to have uh, Mime Zinger on the show, so keep an eye on the sh- on this. We'll tell you, and we have him on. 
All right. I will keep an eye on it. All right. I think we got a couple more questions before we go to our first commercial break. We know that you read. You've made it abundantly clear you do read some fiction. Thus, and I think you said like the big, your favorite big story was Pink Eyes. Yeah. So from I'm assuming you have read some smaller stories. What's been your favorite amongst the more lesser known stories? Uh, well, I mentioned it, it earlier. Um... Project Hive, uh, I updates to that story are far and few between, um, but I enjoy the concept of it and some of the characters. Even though it takes so long to update, I've kind of forgotten some of the character development when each new chapter comes out. Um, Duck and Cover, I also really enjoy. Um, we had uh, we had um, what's his name. Captain Horse Captain song Horse. as well. Yep, we had him on. Um, so delightful. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah, I, I'm kind of a sucker for comedy. Um, I consider myself to... I, I try to be a funny person. Um, funny how? Ha ha funny? Am I a clown to you? Yes. <laughs> you called me a clown. We're all clowns here. I mean, yeah. Um, but outside of Fallout Equestria, um, I'm kind of a sucker for crossover fix. Um, but the best fic I've probably ever read. Um, here, let me. Uh, General George S. Dragon. It's like a World War II reenactment, and it's categorical Grant, I think is one of the funniest stories I've ever read. It it's it's some of the, it's hilarious. If you want to get the link for that BG and post it in the chat, let's uh, share that one around. If I can find it, get a hold of it. All right. Well, we're, this is our last question before our commercial break. Uh, what's been the weirdest fic you've ever read? Oh, that one's easy. Um, I have read uh, Please Downvote by Super Trampoline in its entirety. Um, it has a chapter that only has one word in it, and it's not actually a word, it's negative one. It's <laughs> the number negative one. And then it, in okay. the author's note, it has uh, a link to uh, the Brody Quest parody Pony Quest featuring, like, I think it stars Princess Luna in it. Um, it is a weird story. Um, it, yeah, that's that. It's weird. All right then. Up next is a commercial for our first sponsor of the night, Sparkle Cola, brought to you by our Ministry Mayor, Buttershy. There's a reason Sparkle Cola has remained Equestria's most popular beverage since it was first introduced to the public. Not just its refreshing taste, but also because Sparkle Cola uses only the finest Equestrian ingredients. And we add just the faintest hint of magic for that refined flavor you can only get from an ice-cold Sparkle Cola. Because we're a company you can trust, ran by real Equestrians, you can be sure that Sparkle Cola's spectacular taste just can't be beat. And for every Sparkle Cola you buy, one bit goes to supporting our mares and stallions in uniform. So sit back and enjoy the great equestrian taste of Sparkle Cola. Sparkle Cola. What you want is a spark.
and we're back. So this is where we move on to the uh, discussion part of the show. Let's begin with our first discussion topic of the night. So, spoilers for uh, both FOE and later seasons of MLP, but, you know, you had some time to watch them and read them. It's your own fault you don't know about this stuff. Since Luna died in the fic, what do you guys think happened to the dreamscape? Since we know that she goes into Pony's dreams and does all manners of nonsense in there, what do you think happened to all that after she was gone? Well, I think uh, that the dreamscape and Luna are two very separate things. Um, Luna can enter and uh, interact with the dreamscape, but it is not connected to her. Um, it's its own thing. Like It's still around, just nobody knows how to actually interact with it, except for maybe some ghoul or something. Or maybe the goddess knows, I don't know. But I, I think it's still around and can still be... Uh, potentially uh, into interacted with. I mean, that's a scary prospect that uh, the goddess might have access to the dreamscape and is entering the minds of unsuspecting unicorns in the dead of night, telling them well, you must join the unity. Actually, precedence to that, like with um, I think his name was like priest or something. The uh, pony they meet in uh, Junction R7, um, who's like the disciple of the goddess, he had like visions of her, and Red Eye uh, had interacted with the goddess on some telepathic level, could very well be through the dreamscape. That is somewhat concerning, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that does... In... Go ahead. And that does let you... The chap brings up a good question here. That does mean that a question is going to have some trouble dealing with traitors uh, and not a naysayers, seeing as, you know, your wartime leader can literally watch what you're thinking about in your sleep. Yeah, though I think during the war, at least, Luna had much uh, more pressing matters than watching over the dreams of all her of each and every one of her subjects. Um, after all, she had a war to win. Mm. It, it's still not exactly for a comforting reading, as it were. It's not a comforting thought. Yeah, and I'm sure Pinkie Pie and the MOM would uh, love to get their hooves on a way to access the dreamscape and watch over every single pony out there. Get all the bad ponies! Mm -hmm. like, was in one of the side fix, there Pinkie was a Pie character is who... watching you forever. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Beachy, we sorry we interrupted you. Please carry on. Yeah, in in the side fix, um, Project Horizon Speak by Heartshine, there's a character who invades the main character's dreams I, until shown otherwise by the author, I'm going to presume that he has some way of tapping into that dreamscape of Luna's. Hmm. I mean, I can imagine that, that anyone who has access to that has, frankly, some ludicrous, ludicrous levels of, uh, of power, both to shape the minds of those who, uh, who dream... And frankly, it's just an insane thought that anyone should have access to this power. Now, now you've set the wheels rolling in my head. Uh, I'm starting to build up a theory. Um, I think the dreamscape could be part of what uh, helped create the unity, basically. Uh, like the connected neural net of it all like we see in um new princess's dream of magic sheep like you can connect people through the dreamscape like massive amounts of people like a whole town even or uh a 
across a whole wasteland of alicorns. And I'm going to draw a bit of comparisons to the um, Star Trek's uh, subspace slash warp or whatever it's, it is. Um, I feel like the dreamscape is a sort of parallel universe that's kind of intertwined with the uh, main one and can't really be affected. You can go into the dream space through simple ways of like dreaming or uh, powerful magic like Princess Luna. Or there can be, or if there's sufficiently powerful enough energies like uh, say innervation, um, you know how it affected um, the Alicorn Unity in uh, Huffington. I mean, um, the reason why that was affecting them is because it's literally magic screaming. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm thinking that maybe it also has some effect on the dreamscape, which, like I said earlier, might be the basis of the unity. Hmm. It's still... We can agree that it's a bit... It, it, it's going to be a massive tool to anybody who can get access to it in the wasteland. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. All right, let's move on to our next topic then. This is one that's been brought up uh, a couple of times on the show. Raiders. And what do you think the end game is for them? What do you think the end of the end of because uh, ra- the Raiders stage will eventually have to come to an end? Either the Raiders win and the wasteland is made a worse place, or society wins and the Raiders are gone. But what does that look like? Well, the first very obvious thing is that raiding is unsustainable at a complete scale, like. If raiding is all across, across Equestria and everyone is doing it, it's it won't last. Um, I think, like you said, the in game for raiders is, well, I guess the closest anybody ever got to it was uh, Brimstone Blitz's uh, his uh, Bloodletter Clan and their giant empire they built across the wasteland from Ponyville to uh, across across the whole wasteland itself. Um, just an empire of raiders raiding and pillaging to their heart's content. Um, yeah. I mean, a thought comes to mind about this is that they're kind of trying to enter... I remember listening about this concept in philosophy called ataraxia. Um, What's the issue with the audio? Okay, so they're trying to end. The idea um, is ataraxia, where you never stop asking questions. You never tie yourself down to to a particular thought or an idea about anything and just have the debate forever. This is somewhat similar to the idea of how I think raiders will have to operate. There really isn't an absolute end game for them. It's they have to suspend the um, ending of this wasteland forever to continue their way of life. And yes, you're right. Raiders aren't one unified faction. They aren't one uh, single group of individuals, but they are working towards maintaining this state of raiding ataraxia. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a good way to put it, but um, really, uh, yeah. Um, raiding is completely unsustainable. Uh, Though, but Sorry, carry on your thought. Uh, Black Chainsaw brought up something that would be a good thought to ask about in a moment. So if you want to continue your thought. 
Um, gosh, I lost my train of thought. So. All right, then. Well, Black Chainsaw brings up the thought that um, what about raiders forming kingdoms and nations amongst themselves and raiding each other? Because um, well, I, I suppose that would be like late stage raiders. Um, but even later than that is one of those raider kingdoms winning out. Um, and what do they do when they won and there's no one else to raid? They end up collapsing in on themselves and the cycle starts again. Uh, mm. Or potentially they just form like a feudal society where it's raiding but legitimized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to uh, wrap this a little back to the Fire Blues. One of the potential paths for free Philadelphia um, is the raiders who uh, were slaves in the city uh, led by Barb from Murphy Number Seven, can mm -hmm. actually take control and try and create the end goal Raider Nation and like bring their uh, brand of violence across the wasteland. Become the greatest Raiders the world has ever known. I mean, that probably be pretty cool. Like you know, um, puppeting all of the Raider nations and. Uh, creating like raider vassals out of all of the um, other nations of the wasteland that are civilized. That'd be pretty neato. Though this comes mostly from my, like, when I like to play Hearts of Iron 4, I like to play tall and have lots of vassals and puppet states. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's quite a few different play styles for Hearts of Iron 4. Of course, you can play tall, like you mentioned, have all the vassals. Um, personally, I like to blob out. Um, it's mostly because I'm not very good at managing my vassals. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just saw what Loppy posted in the chat. It's like barbarians winning in Civ. <laughs> Pretty much. Um they're the underdogs of the wasteland. The wasteland's changing. Um, raiding, it, raiding and raiders are a dying job and a dying breed. Um, with all these heroes of the wasteland popping up and taking clans out one by one and these new great nations like the NCR and the Enclave and Red Eye and even the Applejack's Rangers all growing at one point there's really no more room in the wasteland for raiders mm. by the time of uh, Fallout of Estria, or by the time of the end of it though here's a question what to do about all of those people that are ex-raiders people who decided to give up that particular life and try their best to be normal well, what about actually, raiders that perhaps give up that whole thing uh, as a group and like they've raided enough and just stopped being that um fallout equestria actually kind of touches on that um i believe shortly after uh the enclave attack on the new on new appaloosa we're introduced to a minor character who's an ex-raider from shatter hoof and now they work as like hired muscle bodyguard uh on the payroll of Gardena. Um, yeah, I can believe that the NCR's early army would have made up of um, more moneyed and martial mercenary-esque mercenary uh, raiders. Um, and also there's, again, uh, Brimstone Blitz from uh, Murky Number 7, like possibly the greatest raider who's ever lived. Um and he's just stopped raiding and tries to lead a good life, he tries to protect people. And 
that that's like the ultimate redemption arc for Raiders, but um, there's a lot of the times, even after not becoming Raiders, they hold on to their old ways, like uh, the rest of the Blood Letter clan from Murky Number Seven. They're still as violent and bloodthirsty as ever, and eventually they'll be cut down. The thing is, is that there's only a lot of people that want um, to wipe all those raiders out because of all the past deeds. And to be fair to them, you can't exactly blame them for wanting justice because raiders have been a scourge on the wasteland since there's been raiders. And raiders is a not exactly a way of life that leads to nice behavior. Yeah. Um... I think the truly redeemed raiders will be far and few between, and they'll still definitely be discriminated against by the people of the wasteland. Um, any X raider is going to be it's going to have some sort of discrimination against them. Um, like some, it, it all depends on where they are. Like if they're in a to a lawless area, they'll probably be rounded up and lynched or something. Um, if they're in a more safer area, like the new NCR, they might actually find employ employment with the government as mm -hmm. hired mercenaries. I mean, obviously, that's not exactly the best line of work for them. Yeah. Frankly, because they don't have the discipline to actually be a soldier. Or if those who do have discipline... The usually end up being mercenaries ahead of time and would have been already in that line of work. But I'm also thinking of, like, in um, Project Horizons, they've got the gangs of Huffington, which are... They're just raiders. They're just raiders with some extra little bits of, like, personality sprinkled on them, which, mind you, I appreciate and I like, because I like my raiders to have some level of nuance and more than just uh, chem adult lunatics with guns. But um, they, they are just raiders with extra steps. Yeah. Um, Project Horizons fall short in a lot of things. Story, character, um, char main characters. But it's like the side characters that I think are pretty great. Like... Um, Sanguine, he's a pretty great Sanguine, villain. yeah. He's a yeah. I mean he's a pretty interesting villain. He's, Honestly yeah. did not expect that particular turn when I found out his uh reason for doing everything. Um but I'm I've learned I'm apparently in the minority of this. I really enjoy Big Daddy and his goals. I mean Big Daddy um, I I I'm got I would disagree with you there. I think Big Daddy's a big dumb idiot. Uh, okay, yeah. I say he's a big dumb idiot. He, no, he's clever. He's clever that he wants to... He can't win Raiders Round to bringing peace on their own. That, that's just not he's, a thing that you can do. Yeah, he's created peace the best way he knows how. Peace through... Uh, Brutality. Gratuitous violence, yeah. It's um, not exactly peace. It's the closest thing Huffington's ever known to peace. Because, putting it simply, the gangs have to take off either other gangs or off other people. And every, if you take stuff off other gangs, they have to take stuff off other gangs or other people. This is, a, as you mentioned previously, that's a non-sustainable cycle. Um, but really, peace in Huffington is uh, pragmatic peace. It's peace that isn't really a good piece but it's peace nonetheless and that's kind of what the area need needed well before blackjack came in and started doing her own brand of peace honestly though that. the ending of that where they make the new lunar republic no yeah just no that yeah. you, you, they end up just getting sucked into the ncr that's just how it would be yeah like, whoever comes out on top in Huffington, be it the Society or well, anyone but the Enclave, 
But the Enclave isn't even a faction at the end of that. They're basically... Yeah. They're, they've amalgamated what's left of their assets with Huffington as a general coalition. Many of the factions, pretty much all the factions at the beginning of PH, don't exist by the end of it. Like, the Steel Rangers, they're pretty much gone. Um, the Enclave, they're gone. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the Reapers are beaten very heavily uh, especially by the war with the steel rangers um, yeah they get mauled by the war with the steel rangers and they get mauled again by the battle for huffington yeah um if i'm remembering correctly really it's only the collegiate that is survives somewhat intact and the finders technically yeah and they the lose finders, a lot of their material but, wealth but the organization remains as a whole yeah and those two being like the last two that surviving and the ones that probably eventually became the uh, new lunar republic they wouldn't have become the new lunar republic they would have either joined up with some pre-existing faction like, like the, the society the society yeah. was actually in the best position to take over overall control of the region with yeah your best fighters in the region being mauled death by the, the 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 zebra army spoilers by the way yeah uh the finders needing customers the society uh being able to offer protection because they still have a population albeit of serfs mm -hmm. and actual food and the food basically everyone's gonna fall into line around them or the, otherwise they starve to death like in reality because when you yeah. don't have an advanced society, you got whoever controls the food is society. Yeah, and if we look at the NCR and what they're based on, which let's be oh, honest, yeah. they're pretty much a straight rip of the uh, of Fallout's NCR. Um, it's going to become a very class based society. You've got the wealthy people on top, who. And then uh, the less wealthy people on bottom, even, but it's still. The thing is that Stern, not so Stern, uh, Gordina, her talons and her raider army, of well reformed raider army, is entirely untouched by the Battle of Huffington. So yeah. while the society likely could put up a fight and definitely make them bleed for every inch of Huffington they try to take, they definitely lose that engagement after being mauled by. What happened in Huffington? Yeah, but so I frankly, don't think there will be much, there if push came to shove. I don't think there would would have been a fight between the NCR and the Society. No, they would. Um, the Society gains an awful lot by having the NCR be on their side. A market yeah. for their food being one of them, which is mentioned in the fic, by the way, that they are selling food to the Society and from the Society to the NCR. Yeah. So, frankly, no. what would end up most likely happening, in my honest opinion there, is the NCR would make an agreement to either do one of two things. One, bring them in as like a, a, um, a confederated part of the NCR, because they can't afford to not have them, but they don't really want a war with them. Or two, uh, the society will basically act like New Vegas, Normal independence in exchange for something that the NCR want, which is food. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Pretty much like New Vegas at the start of New Vegas. But there's no way in hell that they'd be an entirely independent state that could rival the uh, the NCR. No, that that's not a that's not a fight that they're going to win. Definitely not. Like even with all the secrets of Huffington and whatever. Which it's are which are annihilated by the end of the fic, by the yeah, way. Which are, and even if like some, just a couple survived, it wouldn't make a difference. It, the NCR is too massive. Like, sure, you can have all the greatest stuff, but you're eventually going to lose out to just the sheer immensity of it. Like, I mean, um, if they like, I do think that Princess Grace. Probably, probably could do the political maneuvering needed to put 
the society in a very good position with the NCR and potentially even harness their economy to make her very wealthy. But no way is, is she could uh, muster enough forces to win an outright war of conquest against them or even really resistance. It's just, just not possible. Yeah, definitely. And so does the NCR. I c- there are plenty of enclave elements out there that would, you know, if given the opportunity and ample money, probably work for the NCR too. Yeah, it's, especially with uh, the person who con- who controls the clouds being on uh, the good side of the NCR and being on good terms with them. I mean, I want to point out that the NCR, before it was the NCR, still destroyed the uh, the Enclave and their cloud ships. And there was, well, more to go round. Ra- now there's more of that unity to go round after that business was dealt with. There are enclave and personnel by the bushel in the NCR. Yeah, definitely. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there were military units that defected to the NCR when they saw the writing on the wall that fighting for the the falling enclave government. Let's change sides, boys. Let let's do in Italy and change sides. Yeah, especially after Na- Navarro. Like, especially after Navarro. Especially after losing, like, what, three of their Thunderheads? Um, they only had, like, four of those. Yeah, three. They, they, yeah, they only had four, and they lost three of them. Uh, one over Mary Pony, one over the Cathedral, and one over Philadelphia. Oh, and Celestia 1. We forgot about Celestia 1. The Enclave has Celestia 1. Or not the Enclave. Um, Sorry, uh, NCR. NC, yeah, NCR. The, you have cloud uh, ships. We have the sun. Yeah. And considering they also have uh, complete control of the weather on their side, I don't think you're ever going to have a cloudy day over Tin Pony Tower when they need it. No, it was a uh, Thunderhead. It was a Thunderhead they lost there. Oh, because no, it, they mean... deployed raptors from it. Yeah, I know. I'm talking about the guy in chat who's making the argument. Oh, no, sorry. But anyway, we've gone miles away from what was going to happen with raiders. Yeah, we Indeed. have. So I do like these kind of those diversions. It's quite fun. <laughs> so, yeah. We've concluded that... Huffington, in those immediate moments after their war, is not going to make a new nation that can actually stand up to the NCR. We agree it'll likely either get annexed or have normal independence for food. But anyway, moving on to our next topic for the night. Three. What one is that? Ah, on a much more softer subject, Sparkle Red. I don't think it was mentioned in the fic, but do you think it glows? And is there other flavors of Sparkle Cola out there? Uh, Well, we know of... We know Sparkle Cola Rad is both... It's a pun in two ways. It's a pun on radiation and a pun on radishes. It's a radish-flavored soda. Normal Sparkle Cola is carrot flavored, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, Basically, fizzy carrot juice. Yeah, which doesn't really sound that good. I mean, carrot juice tastes okay. It's quite sweet. Yeah, but I, I have mixed feelings on carbonation. Um, it can be good if done well. Um, on the other hand, there's things like uh, sparkling water. And uh, Topo Chico, which uh, I find to be utterly disgusting. It's like some of the worst tasting drinks I have ever drank. And I have uh, drank vinegar. Um, but back to Sparkle Cola. Um, 
I think, yeah, I think it would glow a uh, red radish color glow. Um, mostly from the decaying isotopes in it. Um, and as for other flavors of Sparkle Cola, well, they've got so many other vegetables to choose from, like uh, asparagus flavor. Mm, that's flavor. not going to be a popular flavor. Yeah. I can imagine, like, I imagine they probably take a more fr fruit flavors or sweeter yeah. vegetables, like, um, what's another great sweet vegetable? Like, you could have a sweet potato flavored drink. Yeah, I don't know. Um, pumpkin, pumpkin juice, carbonated oh, yeah, pumpkin, pumpkin juice. Yeah, pumpkin, that would totally be one. We also have to understand that, you know, the horses, the vegetarians, they have different tastes to us om om omnivorous creatures. Mm -hmm. Daisy flavored one. That might be oh, like I can imagine like um, uh, Sparkle Cola's water range, flavored water, uh, Daisy Sunny. LaCroix Sparkle Cola. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, cherry is obvious flavor. Cherry and carrot. I have actually tried a cherry and carrot flavored drink. It was a Polish drink. I can't remember what the name was, but it was um, like a very orangey, pinkish kind of drink, and it was got carrot juice in there and cherries. It was actually quite nice. Yeah, I'm. I'm not usually one to. Uh, drink a lot of vegetable-based drinks. Um, I, I don't have very good eating habits. Um, I I just can't stomach lettuce or pretty much any leafy green. Um, but dude, you could get some get yourself some gout. Yeah, I know. Um, but something I have tried before are uh, kale smoothies, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, pretty good for your health. Uh, taste like all right. Taste like green. Yeah, they, they taste how they look green. <laughs> it's a bit like uh, Parma violets. They don't taste of any kind of particular fruit flavor. The taste of the color, which. Yeah. For kale, it tastes of the color green, and parma violets of the color purple. Do oranges taste orange? Or, I mean, like, mm. I mean, like Sunny D tastes of the color orange. Uh, it doesn't taste like oranges. Like no orange I ever tasted ever tasted like Sunny D. I, I've tasted citrus that tastes like Sunny D. I can't remember if it was an orange or no. It it had to be some kind of weird orange. I think I think navel orange was it. I mean, I've I had navel oranges exactly. before, but they did not taste like Sunny D. It's been quite a while since I've had a navel orange, but I I know for a fact that I've tasted um, oranges that taste somewhat like Sunny D. Um, Though it may have been uh, American public school lunch food orange, which God knows what that is. And it's it's probably it the color orange again. Yeah. It, it actually no, those weren't even orange. They were yellow, sometimes <laughs> green. Man, this I is quite an interesting digression. I'm just saying, when you have a pear that is hard as a rock and milk that is frozen, you know something's wrong with the lunch. It's a bit too chilled. Yeah. It's, it's been a bit too one, long in the deep freeze. For one, the pear was unripe. Uh, I remember that much. And, yeah, the frozen milk was an ongoing thing. For, like half of my junior year in high school let's not bring up school ptsd guys this is not a time for that one uh indeed let's not <laughs> sparkle cola dark 
the sarsaparilla flavored cola. Is that a thing? I mean, like I know yeah. that I know that Nuka Cola made uh, dark. They uh, apparently made it as a direct competitor to Sunset Sarsaparilla, which in I FOA imagine, is Sunrise Sarsaparilla. I imagine um, that Sparkle Cola Dark would taste kind of like um, I don't know if you've ever had Cuban Iron Beer. It's kind of like a root beer taste. It's like a midway point between root beer and sarsaparilla and if i remember correctly it's fruit based um that's how i imagine it would taste for the sake of our sponsor tonight who is also sarsaparilla sunset sarsaparilla sorry sorry sunrise sarsaparilla that's that off brand sunrise uh we have to say that Sunrise Sarsaparilla is a swell drink and goes well with anything that you can have on a hot sunny day. Definitely. Don't bring that one up, Black Chainsaw. We can't have the Bethesda guys knocking on our door. But anywho, on to our next topic of the night. Stealth bugs and stealth cloaks. How do they work? Because I've heard of quite a few different ways of uh, of doing this one. Well, I'm going to go... The easy answer is magic. And we can end the discussion there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm definitely no uh, physicist or whatever. whatever brand of science it would be around that um but i would say some magic that scatters light somehow um not sure if that would work because if from what we can tell you can see through someone wearing a stealth cloak or a stealth buff if it scatters the light yeah. it would just show up as a pony shaped void where there's no light well, I don't know if scatter is the correct word for it. More like diffuses the light. Kind of like, um, you know those, like, uh, not the actual NASA picture of a black hole, but like the more uh, conceptual kinds, where it's like the whole black hole with like light bending around it. Um, I think oh, yeah, the gravitational lensing, yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of like that. I have a. I actually have a counter proposition. It's a. Um, what was it called in the fic? A bypass spell? Yeah, I think that was right. So basically, it allows light to pass through the object, or rather, pass through uh, as if there was nothing there. So it's not strictly speaking a stealth cloak. You're still physically there, and you are a physical object that can be interacted with. Uh, it's not like... Um, is this the light doesn't interact with you in any way? Well, I, I see stealth cloaks and uh, stealth bucks uh, kind of like Fallout stealth boys. You can still very, very faintly see like highlights and the actual person, but only if you know where to look and if you're looking right at them. Um, but I think um, slightly off topic, but uh, like Trixie and the Alicorn's invisibility spell is like perfect invisibility, like completely magic based and literally just kind of deletes them. Well, the argument there is that you would be able to see them if you could see magic. Because if they're being cloaked via magic, you would see, probably if you could see in that spectrum of, uh, I say spectrum, if you could see magic for whatever reason, like you had some kind of device that allows you to see magic fields, you would be able to see those things sneaking up on you. Well, the same can be said for uh, stealth bucks and 
stealth cloaks. Uh, they're we know for a fact gemstone based. Like Rarity is able to find out find where one is because she used a gemstone finding spell and detected the gemstone used to power the self cloak. Yeah, that's true. That was how she discovered the first uh, infiltrator. On that point, though, didn't wasn't to mention like it wasn't a, like a linchpin of the plan that zebras are not affected by mind magic, so the, the goddess couldn't peer into the mind of Zenith because zebras are immune to that sort of stuff. But then we have a memory orb of this zebra that uh, Rarity caught. And we get to watch. I think it was more the goddess couldn't see non-pony's minds. Like, she's still... The unity is still caught by surprise by the Hellhound's attacks, even though they live in the same region. If she could read their minds, she could probably know when they're going to attack. Like, the Alicorns are caught by surprise by them during their attack while uh, Little Pip and company are there. Uh, that uh, Maripony. Um, yeah, I, I think it's more she can only read the minds of ponies. Hmm. But yeah, going back, let's just bring all the chat brought up. Uh, Tony Hummel, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, couldn't it be a spell that simply prevents observation instead of messing with light? I mean, it could. It's magic. Magic exists in this universe. It's entirely possible. I can't remember where I've read something like that. Um, yeah. It's... Yeah, it's instead of, like, um, being invisible, it's like you're still there, but you... People, it, like, people are directed to not notice you. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily think that. It's just they... As far as they're concerned, you're not there. Yeah, like, that like, could also be it. Like, I imagine that you could be, like, uh, another uh, member of the comments here, say cameras could potentially pick them up. So there's a, you, there's a reason why you would just destroy cameras and delete footage if you're infiltrating somewhere as a zebra because you're... Um, you can be seen by devices because devices don't have perceptions to be altered. They just see things. But th that raises the question, does the magic still affect the footage? Like, if someone viewing the footage, if someone views the footage, are they affected by the magic and their mind tells them that, oh no, there's nothing there because of that magic? I don't know. I don't know. that This is the whole thing we have this point to bring up, because these are questions that need to be asked. Maybe? That would seem like a very odd stretch of where the magic could take you. I'd imagine it would only be people who can make direct obser observance to you. Because it would seem really odd that it could bend effectively time and space into mechanical objects. Yeah. I suppose this is like walking the line between physical magic of just making yourself completely invisible to any lens, uh, be it lens of the eye or lens of a camera, as opposed to making yourself invisible to the mind. I imagine probably all of these thoughts were brought up. Like, I can imagine in a fic centered around um, maybe in Zebrica. Um, likely, this is what the thought process for zebras when they were developing these things were going through. How do we make someone invisible? Do we stop them from being directly observed? Do we try and make them actually invisible? I've just been reminded reminded that stealth bucks affect the smell of the user like if yes if they have really sweat, inbuilt like a smell masking it would also it also uh, dampens the sound i mean those seem like relatively simple things that's just um 
I imagine it if it tries to pass through the the fabric. Oh, pardon. Uh, it basically just dampens sensory output in that circumstance. I mean, that would be the obvious way to do it. It just dampens sensory output. Like, it's not true invisibility or true uh, scent hiding or true sound muffling. It's like a silencer for a gun. It doesn't actually make it completely silent. It just suppresses the sound. Yeah. go. Yeah, this is like an I like because um the the question first comes up then how what do the zebras do and then what did the ponies do as well because they eventually got their hooves on uh, stealth technology and it obviously brings up the question what did they do instead did they just straight up copy it or did they try to do it in their own way are they different at all? I think the ponies tried to directly copy it, but couldn't really crack it. Because if I remember correctly, the zebra stealth float, like, almost completely negates sound altogether. While the uh, pony stealth buck uh, doesn't completely negate it, just muffles it. And, like, stealth bucks are an inferior copy of stealth bugs hmm well this is a topic that we could spend forever on but unfortunately we do have to keep moving on so let's move on to our next topic of the night Kirin's in FOE I believe you said you're going to have a diatribe about this one please feel yeah. free I, I've already uh, apologized in advance to uh, the lovely hosts here, um, but audience, I apologize to you now. I have very, very strong opinions about Kieran's, um, and you're about to hear them. Um, I hate Kieran's, plain and simple. They should not be as important as the fandom makes them. Um, they only appeared in a meaningful way in one episode which in my opinion was just a mediocre episode um the main kieran autumn whatever her name is i can't even remember her full name. autumn autumn leaf autumn burst She's autumn blaze it was blaze. blaze yeah she's i don't she's just a mediocre character and i know this is um because the uh show producers were uh, on a time constraint, but all of the Kirins, save for the big one, have the exact same body type. Like, there's no difference between them other than eyelashes. Like, with ponies, you see, even even in the same genders, of course, you've got uh, sexual dimorphism, but um, you see, like, ponies are skinny or fat or tall or short or have different shaped muzzles. Kirins all look the same. They, there's nothing special about them. Uh, especially Nurik, their Nurik form, looks, they literally look all the same. It's just copy and paste with, I think, if I remember correctly, different change of eyes or something. Um, but really, just... I don't think Kieran's should be as important as everyone makes them out to be. There's like copious amounts of fan art of them, which is uh, pretty grating to say the least. Um, well, it seems like every other week I see just mass spam of Kieran art. Um, but back to the original question, Kieran's info. Um, the Kieran community we see in the show is incredibly isolated. Like, barely anyone knew they existed. The ponies didn't even know who they were um, when they arrived. I don't think they would have been affected by the war at all. They don't have anything special to offer to either side. I mean, 
maybe Nurek form is more powerful or some more powerful or something, but in the episode, from what I remember, it's just like Kieran, but angry and uh, un, a little bit uncontrollable. Um, yeah, I don't think they would be much of a. I don't think they would be affected by the war or the mega spells, uh, other than ambient radiation and nuclear winter and such. Um, I think they would get by relatively okay. If, depending on their actual geographical location, if it's far enough away from Equestria and the Zebra Nation. Um, maybe some would come to Equestria, break the isolation, um, travel the wasteland. Maybe some would go to the Zebra Lands, travel there. But it, I don't think they would be that important in the wasteland. Yeah, that's fair. They're a tiny population and all. I mean, I, you couldn't really even call them a nation. Like, maybe you could, like, stretch to a city-state by the end of the war? Maybe? On a good day? Yeah, really, that's... That's the best you can get from them. Um, some kind of trading city-state, maybe? trade with both sides neutral intermediary or rather I would imagine them more like an isolationist city state uh, fuck yeah. everybody leave us alone and we'll just stay here bye like um, in EAW Equestria or uh, the plans for Kieran once uh, Zebraka comes out is they're pretty much Imperial China China isolationists uh, they don't care about the outside world they're just doing their own thing which is in line with what we see in the show i mean obviously you won't be prepared for all the um uh magical holocaust that would happen because nobody was prepared for that one but uh let, let's be honest here They'd probably be better prepared than most folk because they literally live on a plateau on a mountain away from everybody else where there's no other populated targets nearby. They'd be mostly fine. They'd just sit up in their mountain and not give a fuck about anybody else. They might deal with a big bunch of refugees, maybe, or they might just gun them all down. Entirely possible, too. But, uh, yeah, they would almost certainly just be as they were before. Shut themselves off from the rest of the world. And they'd be fine. Yeah, like, I, I think if they continue the path that they were already on, being isolationist and such, maybe they don't keep up the great silence like we saw in the episode. Um they, they really wouldn't affect the Fallout Equestria world in any meaningful way. Like there may be, a, like you said, a handful of them outside of their uh, ancestral home. And that's probably be about it. They'd eventually die off because they've got no one to breed with. Unless they live longer, then that's something I don't know about. Unfortunately, there isn't that much to discuss about this. It's kind of just, uh, they don't care. Uh, I want to address um, Termi Hummel's uh, comments about the, the, cure, the bats being, or Thestrals being the same issue. Yes, it is the same issue. I have the same problem with uh, Thestrals and the copious amount of uh, love the fandom seems to give them. Um, that I have with Kieran, um, and he mentioned, uh, or she, I don't know, um, zebras, zebras are developed in Fallout Equestria. They're developed into actual people, actual characters. Um, yes, in the show, they're not really that 
big of a deal and they're not really that big of a deal in the fandom either um they're just kind of there kind of about the same amount of love that griffins or yaks are given they they exist yeah um though on the point of bat ponies what i don't like is this concept or thought that all the bat ponies live in canterlot yeah why would that be the case um like i'm all willing to to give the ground and say that you know bat ponies don't exist in huge numbers and they're not a significant part of the population like maybe what five ten percent of the population yeah they're definitely a minority but I'm going to be honest, I've been playing Equestria at War for so long that I don't see the bats living anywhere else but in the most remote part of the world, it's like in the deep jungles or in the mountains or whatever. That, that at, least in at, Equestria at, War, in Equestria at War. At least in Equestria at War, the reason why they are there is because everybody hates them. And they think they're all criminal scum. Yeah, those doesn't squeakers... Don't uh, surprise me at all that they've been pushed to the outer reaches of everywhere, places where nobody wants to live. So, yeah. Strikes me that um, the idea that everyone thinks that all the bat ponies were living in Cantalot and they all died when the city got destroyed it, is silly. There'd be plenty of them out there, Yeah, really, but they'd still but, be a minority. Uh, that... We've actually changed in Balefire Blues. Um, in the main stories of Fallout Equestria, there's Lionheart is the only one in the original story that we ever see, who's former night guard from Canterlot, or the uh, Black Mountain ones in Project Horizons, which are just that one, which Project Horizons explains away as being the only bat pony nation or yeah, only large amount of bat ponies left in the wasteland that's changed um yeah like, like have... that was silly that was silly thinking that they're the only bat ponies no like you can't have a stable population from a couple of hundred of them even with inbreeding being considered yeah um actually uh in the first release, there will be more bat pony nations than there will be zebra nations, seeing as how this is Equestria, it's where the ponies live. Um, there's a smaller one that doesn't really matter what much in uh, Manhattan called uh, Maryland. It's uh, based on Harlem, um, Harlem, New York City. Um, and then I'm going to share the story of New Mango. Honestly, I, when I was creating it, I was just made it to fill space. Turns out, I had totally forgotten that uh, mangoes are kind of a meme in the fandom when it comes to bat ponies. Because they're all fruit bats. Yeah. Um, and now we've actually got one of the head developers from Equestria at War, uh, Cyrus, He's actually on our team and is developing New Mango, and some of his work on it is really promising. Um, it's got the potential to become one of the uh, best minor nations in the in the game right now. Looking forward to it. Uh, I'll probably have a little look see when it comes out, so I'll be interested. But anywho. Let's move on to our last question of the discussion. Nope, that is the last question. That is the last question. So, given that, we'll move to our next commercial break, which is brought to us by uh, Sunrise Sarsaparilla. What's that swell-looking stuff you're drinking? Well, my boy, it's the cool, refreshing taste of Sunrise Sarsaparilla. Unlike Sparkle Cola, Sunrise always stays smooth and carbonated. 
And there's no risk of death by radiation poisoning. Jeepers, that's keen. You said it, grass stain. Remember, kids, sip your sunrise sarsaparilla to keep you shining, sharp, and swell. It's the official drink of the Junior Steel Rangers. Sunshine, you'll be mine, sunrise sarsaparilla. Right then, we're now back for the final part of our stream tonight. So, our next thing is questions from the audience. Please feel free to ask any more questions while we're doing this. We'll be happy to answer them, or as best as we can. But the first and only question we have thus far is, would food be even important, seeing as uh, Gardens of Equestria is a thing? Well... I don't I think it would still be important because you still need the infrastructure to uh create the food like um and pretty much nowhere in the wasteland save for a few scattered places like the society in Huffington and before their clouds went to hell the enclave and uh, technically um the ever free forest which was red eye's plan yeah and red eye was starting to create an infrastructure for that uh, before he died. Um, but really nowhere else had actual farming infrastructure for large-scale projects that could actually feed the entire wasteland. It would seem to me that... Anyone who already has a farming infrastructure in place and people working for them to build up uh, food as is, when the land is cleaned of radiation, they're already in prime position to become the next Brahmin Baron or um, basically. Uh, what's the right word? Basically, they'll, they'll, they'll be prime position to build plantations feeding the wasteland. Yeah, like uh, early Japan and their uh, rice kings. Oh yeah, the Sunrise Kingdom. Yeah, that was... Um, this is just how farming and civilization works. Those who already have some infrastructure already get to benefit greatly when more stuff improves that. This is just an, a repeating of history at this point. Like, for example, you know, uh, if you know your history, civilization always started in dank river valleys that were nice and fertile, ideally had um, mild weather and predictable flooding cycles. Don't need all of these things, but having many of them is always beneficial. And building up society, which means you have invention and a concentration of population, just makes this easier and better. Those who are already running this just get better when things get improved for them. So it strikes me as Gardeners of Equestria isn't quite the level leveling of the playing field as you may imagine it to be. It just entrenches those who already have uh, power and food over the wasteland into a much better position, seeing as they have the infrastructure, the money, and other assets to exploit it. Didn't expect to take a rip out of Das Kapital uh, today. But uh, yeah, any more in the chat wanting to ask anything? Yes, absolutely there would be a refugee crisis. 100% there'd be a refugee crisis. Those poor, poor pig pits. Like, this is one of my big criticisms of Little Pip. Frankly, she killed more people because of her recklessness taking over control of the, uh, the Enclave food operation than any raider, any organization, even Red Eye. She killed more people because of her actions. Yeah, I remember saying that she didn't want to uh, do it, but she 
they kind of forced her hand. Like things were moving so fast when by the time she had actually gotten into the uh, SVP control room that she had to, or else the whole wasteland would be. She couldn't do it slowly. Cauterize was already in full swing. She had to stop it right there and then with one swift move. Oh, I that get it. Was... And yeah, I don't think that she made the wrong decision there. But the, if anyone argues that somehow this was somehow a great moral choice, no, it absolutely wasn't. This was still a morally gray choice at best. You yeah, definitely she she can condemn the lives of thousands. So the wasteland could have sun. Oh yeah, they're almost so, assuming they would be given equal citizenship status, they'd absolutely be a massive voting block. Because they would vote for any politician that would either increase their role in society or reduce uh, any kind of discrimination by wastelanders, which would be great because Wastelanders are, as a group of people, not exactly the most educated or tolerant groups of people. That's putting it lightly. So, yeah, putting it mildly, they would be a very influential voting block in the early NCR. A same with slavers would be a very influential voting block. Now, here are my thoughts on this one. I once ran an FOE game uh, in a tabletop which uh, BG can attest to, where the burgeoning NCR um, had to make an agreement with the slavers, because I imagine that once Red Eye was gone and Stern started trying to take in the reins, like you tried to put in your mod, other slaver warlords that are part of Red Eye's empire would try to break away, all with their own armies of slaves, all with their own agendas and ideas of what they want to do. So the burgeoning NCR would have had enough material and manpower to fight any individual warlord and possibly even win. But they then leave themselves exposed to all of the other warlords within taking them out. So in this universe I created, the NCR made a deal with them. They made a deal saying that any warlord that joined them could keep their personal slaves and they could keep and their closest um, entourage as it were could keep their personal slaves but your broad majority of your army has to be like, made free and any more slaves cannot be bought in exchange you become part of the NCR This is something that I came up with, because this seems like something that Gord would try to push for, because it's a compromise that means that the NCR gets to live. I think that would make... It makes sense for God to do, but it, it would make her very, very unpopular with her main power base at Shattered Hoof. It uh, would. They were all but this is how politicians place. also work. Yeah. They would have... That it's if she was a canny, po a canny politician, she would abandon this base that got her to power in exchange for a base that can support her maintaining power. The people that get you to power when it comes to the keys aren't necessarily the ones that keep you there. So this makes sense to me that she would be willing to make uh, a sacrifice for some people to get free and some get to stay as slaves so that the NCR as an organization can exist and slowly weed out slavery over time. Yeah, yeah I, I can definitely see that happening. Um, I think it would... It would kind of be like the, the darker part darker side to um, Gaudina's presidency. Um, like, uh, to draw from history, um, a lot of the stuff, like uh, the CIA stuff, that's like still, some of it's still classified. And but, The CIA have done an awful lot of fucky stuff in their past, and a lot of it is just 
astounding, really. At the time, people didn't know and thought, oh, the CIA is uh, working in everyone's interest. Um, nowadays, we've uh, seen unclassified reports and stuff like that and seen that it was not so much in everyone's interest and uh, not very good for anyone at all, save for uh, a very select few. I know that we that FOE compared to Fallout is a lot more of a um, black and white moralistic stance and stuff, mostly because KCAT wanted to make a very moralistic story that you could quite clearly see these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. Which is fine. Yeah. That's fine as a story goes, because stories can 100% uh, take that kind of position with themselves. But that's not how reality works. Reality is very rarely in black and white. Yeah, and I don't think outside of the... Like, when you actually step back to evaluate the story and look at people's motives, um, you see it becomes a little grayer. And you, if you start actually connecting things that weren't explicitly stated in the story... Uh, like, for example, Velvet Remedy. Um, she's not a good person. She's pretty... She's kind of an asshole, the whole story. She's um, also ignored the whole fucking story. That's true. Um, any time that they've asked her for any kind of input on anything, basically Little Pippa's gone, no, Velvet, that will never work. Yeah, definitely. And, um, like, even we mentioned earlier, Little Pip is not the paragon of virtue she still even if she tried to keep the refugee crisis from the enclave to a minimum she still caused one and the um, fact is is that the hardest part yeah. of this um alternate reality i even came up with with because i well i say alternate reality we don't know what the reality really was like we only have snippets of it that Little Pippa actually is the biggest obstacle to what Gordina wants to do there if she wanted to prevent the NCR from collapsing instantaneously. Because Little Pippa has already taken a very black and white stance on slavery. Slavery is objectively bad in all circumstances, and I don't disagree with her on that one. But politics is never, ever black and white. Yeah. Like, Little Pip can either A, start a refugee crisis and then doom the NCR to fail because she then just returns the cloud cover without any means to, for anyone to produce any food to punish the NCR for thinking that slavery is okay. Or she can start a refugee crisis and then abandon some of her own moral positions so the NCR can potentially make things better in the future. Yeah. Little Pip for the majority of the story, believes she that the world is black and white. and I don't blame her for having that thought, because she was raised in a stable. Yeah, and she, she was raised to believe that. She was raised to believe zebra's bad, pony's good. Um, and that sort of thing. And, like, the goddesses know everything. They're, they're great. They're unfallible. And when when that starts to shatter is when she starts become to become a more morally gray character, especially like that it starts to break almost immediately, but it really shows uh, during uh, the trial of Monterey Jack. Um, Again, I don't want to spoil the... what we had in our heart swarming special. We had plenty to say on that particular trial. Yeah, um, Tin Pony believes what it's doing is black and white. This man is has confessed guilty to be cri to uh, crimes of raiding. Um, so simple. Let the law deal with him. He's to be put to death. Um, little Pip 
sees it a bit grayer. He was just doing it to survive. Um, and then she tries to break him out, and that's when she really starts to become a gray character. Instead of the paragon of virtue that the DJ makes her out to be. Which is a mm. recurring issue in the story. Though it yeah. seems to me that the DJ eventually realizes that Little Pip is a morally gray character at the yeah, at exact when... wrong fucking moment. Yeah. Uh, Arbu. <laughs> yes, Arbu. We have plenty to say about Arbu too. Please, go watch that. I'll... BG, if you could grab the link for that, that'll be fantastic and post it in the chat. Oh boy, you mean uh, Toffee? Yes, well not Toffee, I get um, uh, our show's Hearthwarming special. Alright, give me a moment. But yeah. But it, the the friend... who... Sorry, carry on. The character who really stays true to morals throughout the whole story and it's one of the reasons he's my fav my favorite character in this story is a calamity like he stays true no matter what even when his best friend starts to uh turn not so great he still sticks to his morals like he he has doubt in little pip he he knows she's not unfallible or infallible um and it makes the story better for it but yeah like the most morally upstanding characters in the story arguably are the ones that i think are some of the worst moral actors in the uh, in the story. Like, I would argue that shooting kids, even if that kid is a raider, is probably not a good thing. So Calamity in that circumstance is potentially... Well, when you think about it, what yeah, was I, what was the right moral call in there? Because I don't think there was one. Yeah, there really wasn't a right moral call, but Calamity sticks to what he thinks is right, and that that's, again, what makes him a great character. He, st he, st he sticks to what he knows is to be the correct morally right way to do it, which is no raiders. It's, like he says, it's his policy. And the other most moral upstanding character, in my opinion, is also one of the worst moral characters in the story, which is Steel Hooves. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's... He, he does very true, stick by his outdated morals. Yes. He's still a horrible, disgusting racist right up to the moment he dies. Yeah. Um, but then again... He's a very old ghoul, raised in a time where there's nothing but zebra propaganda, and frankly, he's got no good reason to be nice to zebra. Definitely, he just he fought for how long did the war go? Like twenty odd years. Uh, we don't know. Zebra and we now, don't know. Like yeah. I usually, like I've made the estimate on this show about forty years. Yeah, um, I believe in Balefire Blues we have it at. Um, if the war started around season three, um, or actually, no, it wasn't season three. Uh, it was midway through season two, which is that's when uh, the war about started. Um, we have it in the mod to be going for 33 years if season two took place in the year uh, 1002. Um, it means at the end of the war would be 1035. Yes, which, and the mod takes place 200 years after that in 1235. Mm. So, uh, Termi Hummel uh, br brings up Unlike Celestia. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Are you saying that she's not on a morally upstanding character? Because I 
think she kept to her morals as well. She was willing to abdicate power to maintain her morals. Yeah, Celestia is one of the most morally driven characters. Like, um, like you said, she abdicated power to keep true to her morals and to not put anyone else in danger. And ironically, it was because she abdicated, which turned the war from a war of resources to a war of ideology, a war of holy war, effectively. And I, I don't know if she fully realizes that, but she knows she she knows after two hundred years of her quote unquote punishment um, that what she, that abdicating was the wrong decision. Eventually, she realizes that, and like uh, she she's punished for it for two hundred years. She's forced to watch all the people that she cared about just go to shit. Yeah, all of her little ponies just uh, yeah. morally decay and become a rancid canker on her once green and pleasant land. And like she said in the fic, she stopped watching after the Enclave massacred. I think it was said to be like nearly a thousand people at uh, Friendship City. Um, I, I, I may be a little biased, but I think Celestia is one of the most intriguing characters in um, Fallout Equestria and the show in it's general. The... I like her because I p- prefer her over Luna as a character. Yeah, Luna has kind of I. Luna has kind of become too Luna much Dan. of a yeah too much of a character yeah. within the fandom. She's too she's both too interesting and too edgy at the same time. Celestia, I think, is just a wholesome character. She's just I trying think... to do right while being presented to the world as some godlike entity with unfathomable cosmic power. But mm-hmm. at the end of it, she is just a person able of making poor judgments and bad moral choices. And to quote PH, uh, she's done fuck-ups that have killed millions. Uh, and again, she's a great character. Hashtag not biased. Hashtag I do not have most of my internet accounts as... Celestia as my profile picture. Not gonna lie. Um, uh, actually, remind me, is there actually any way to get Celestia in the mod? Yes, actually. Um, I know the audience members can't see it, but you probably can through Discord. Um, my profile picture, the uh, scan line in green Celestia, is actually uh, the portrait uh, that is used in game for the um, no spoilers on how you get it uh, secret path for the enclave where you can actually get her in charge. Nice. But I'm uh, hunting for how to find, how to get that done. <laughs> hmm. I'll just probably ask at some point. Um, but Terma Hummel also brings up another question. What do we think the future of the NCR is, given that they don't really control that much land and population at the end of FOE? Well, it's funny that you bring that up. I did bring up a moment ago that uh, Gordina might decide to give amnesty to some slaver warlords to both boost her army and uh, give her potentially a position of strength that she could use to actually stabilize the core wasteland. But that's one possible thing. Another one is basically turtling up. Just occupy all the spaces in Manhattan and areas where you have troops loyal to you outside of that and just hole up and wait for the, the, uh, the slavers to continue beating each other to death. Then just take over um, the ruins. Yeah, pretty much. I, th- I think Godina and Shattered Hoof are the foundation that the new order of the Wasteland will be is built on. Uh, if I remember correctly, for Godina's help in um, with 
for God even his help uh, with Little Pip in the fight against uh, Cauterize and Red Eye. Um, she's granted control of Philadelphia, which um, and all of Red Eye's operations there. And it's likely due to the help that she sent to the Tin Pony during that same events and the camaraderie from that, that Tin Pony, the reigning power in Manhattan, would likely join the NCR and the rest of the wasteland would most likely follow suit or at least places like New Appaloosa and things like that. Yeah, New Appaloosa almost certainly would look for protection, but um, Old mm -hmm. Appaloosa, depending on how it got hit with the Warlord yeah. Crisis, because there's going to be a Warlord Crisis, given the Red Eye is, you know, offed and all that. Um, maybe, maybe they join with the NCR, maybe they become their own faction, maybe they just become a vassal state of New Appaloosa. We don't know. Yeah. Um... I also think uh, at least the scattered rock farmers in the area around Shattered Hoof would join the NCR. And oh, yeah. They'd have pretty much no choice. Yeah. Um, the the one faction I don't see joining the NCR is actually the Applejacks Rangers. Really? They would stay like I as could, protectors. I, like, I would have way. argued... Sorry. I would have argued that the Steel Rangers would be the ones that just uh, go, uh, no, we're not interested in this stuff. We'll got, we got our mission. Uh, don't get in our way, and we won't have to fight with you. The Applejacks Rangers strike me as they probably just fold in because their mission is about helping people, not technology anymore. That's true, but I think it comes down to the way that they help people. The NCR helps people by creating new order and uh, new foundation in the wasteland, new law and such, while the Applejacks Rangers is more like frontier justice sort of thing. They're out there crushing raider gangs and fighting uh, slavers and enclave remnants and ghouls and such, while the NCR is busy like building up civilization again. I can argue that they want to keep their own autonomy, but I imagine that they would basically make themselves as a paramilitary organization, part of the NCR. Yeah, I think they would be kind of like um, Fallout's uh, Desert Rangers, kind of. I mean, they're technically like an integrated part of the NCR, but they do tend to act with a level of autonomy. Well, kind of. Um, I mean, like, before... Uh, New Vegas, you know, there's that big statue. Uh, oh, yeah, like I know you're on New Vegas. The, That's mostly like a homage to um, Wasteland 2, if it, um, is it not? I can't remember, but uh, the history behind that statue is that it's um, celebrating the, uni the Ranger NCR unification, where the Rangers officially became a part of the NCR instead of just kind of autonomous frontier justice fighters on mm. the fringes of NCR society and the uh, and out and about in the wasteland, which I kind of see that being the Applejack's Rangers um, new Canterlot Republic dynamic. I mean, I can I can also see what uh, Terma Hummel also said that uh, they might demand uh, military positions in exchange for integration. Because I could argue that, you know, high-ranking members of the Steel Rangers almost certainly would have much greater potential as generals and as members of authority than maybe other Wastelanders. They'd have more experience with uh, positions of power in a formal structure. Yeah, definitely. I think if that were to come to pass, there would definitely be a like internal military struggle between the Talons and the Steel Rangers. Maybe not open combat, but at least some sort of a political chess game between the two. Almost certainly. And I imagine in that circumstance, whichever faction ended up the lesser of the two, unless they were suitably appeased, would likely just break away again. Yeah. 
if the Talons were to lose that, not all of them would leave. Because of course, many of them are personally loyal to Gordina. Yeah, but some of the ones that Gordina swayed only with, I guess, promises of power and such, they would leave definitely if they Hmm. ended up losing that struggle. Honestly, I think the only organizations that would be integrated into the NCR in their military capacity that wouldn't be upset about the power struggle would probably be Enclave Remnants, because they're already used to a very rigid power structure. And since the whole everything collapsed, they probably have a great deal of goodwill to any organization that's willing to take them on. Yeah, definitely. Um, Especially, I think they would be extremely grateful to anyone who's like, yeah, we're not going to discriminate against Pegasi. You can come in and fight for us. Because uh, the Enclave are kind of seen, especially after Cauterize, how the Zebra were seen during the Great War. Just the boogeymen of the Wasteland. Um, They are not loved, and like you mentioned earlier, the Waste... People of the Wasteland are um, not very well educated, and uh, certainly the uh, angry mob forming type. So, yeah. What else would happen? Well, obviously they'd try to pick up pieces of Red Eye's plan that actually would work, like the rapid industrialization and the turning of the Everfree Forest into... uh, farming land for both lumber because you need lumber to build the wasteland and food because it's the only real large plot of untainted land in most of that part of the wasteland the ancient forest that is the everfree would be culled for the sake of um, rebuilding equestria now we could argue potentially that they'd see this ancient forest's uh, contribution as worthy of reforesting it once it's no longer needed. But frankly, the the forests will burn in the fires of industry. Because you need lumber to make charcoal to fire those factories. You need lumber to build the houses that's going to be rebuilding all that population. I think if they can take down the Everfree temporarily, the the people have been trying to beat back the Everfree for literally thousands of years. And it's still there the whole time. Red Eye had... They they can burn down all the evil plants, but uh, like weeds, I think the forest will just spring back up eventually. It may take some time, but it'll come back. This is a wild place. Unless it was completely wiped out, which, good luck... It's going to be hard killing all those animals and wild plants and trees. Because this is a truly living ancient forest that does not want to be. Sorry. I was trying to say something. You say your thing now. Unless you turn it into a smoking crater, the forest will come back. Uh, Again, another question. Another good one brought up. Same person. Uh... Likely, Philadelphia's industrial output would be damaged. Absolutely, would be would be damaged by this, given the fact that uh, you know the warlords would be fighting over it. It's Red Eye's empire. It was very valuable. He had some of the only working factories in the wasteland, at least real factories, not these um, like um, a steel shack somewhere with some presses inside. No, actual working factories. Yeah, and another thing that you got to consider is after the uh, Enclave attack on Philadelphia and the subsequent destruction of all the Enclave who attacked Philadelphia, there's tons of salvage there. Oh, yeah. Untapped resources from the Enclave. Like, you got a whole Thunderhead there to scrap and discover its secrets. I'm sure that would be quite valuable and a boon to the economy of whoever controls Philadelphia in the area. And I imagine if the NCI gets organized, they'd probably try and take the cathedral off those uh, people living there. Definitely, yeah. Especially with all the technological secrets that have. 
it hides. But there's no way in there. That it's... Sorry, carry on. And due to the fact that it's like a center point in uh, all operations that you could do in the Everfree, if you want to do something in the Everfree, you got to have the cathedral to coordinate it all. Hmm. There's not a snowflake's chance in Vulcan's Forge that the cathedral be left alone to its own devices. Someone's oh, going to yeah, want that. Not. And again, back to uh, Wasteland, like, suspicion. That's the former, like, Palace of Red Eye. And uh, it, it already from that, it's got a target painted on its back just from the anger and suffering that Red Eye caused. And Tamahamal also brings up that there's a lot of slaves in Philadelphia that aren't going to really want to go back to working in those factories. Seeing as the fact that they've been slaving away in them, sure, situation would probably improve. Like, they first would be paid for their work, and likely the conditions would be much better, and their children aren't someone's property. But they're not going to want to do that. They're not going to want to slay away in the factories for anybody. I think the thing that'll keep them there is fear of the unknown. Sure, it may have been bad here, but now we know it's going to get better here, but we don't know how bad things are outside of the city. Sure, we can hear from the radio, but maybe the radio's not always right. I think... Yeah, I, I just think fear of the unknown would keep the uh, former slaves there, or most of them at least. Some will definitely leave. Hmm. But yeah, anything you want to add, BG? Not a whole lot. The, uh, the general, you know... <clears throat> Well, sluggishness in adopting to adapting to a new life, lifestyle, especially with you know the learned helplessness of slaves, probably would keep more of them there than would be willing to admit. <laughs> mm. Well, I do imagine that um, that the choice would be put to them most likely. You can either a continue working in the factories, something that you have experience with doing, and now receive pay and better conditions, and your children aren't someone's property, and you get to live in an actual place once we build it. Uh, or you can go work in the Everfree, uh, becoming a farmer eventually once we've opened up some land for farming. Because they're going to need ponies to work that. And what's the biggest uh, puddle of manpower in the wasteland if it's not the slave settlement of Philadelphia? Yeah, definitely. Uh, like that's reflected in um, the mod. Actually, uh, Philadelphia is the largest concentration of population in the whole wasteland. That's um, it's split up. It's split up across a couple of uh, tiles states. Yeah, and um, but it's it's still I think like nearly. 35,000 people there or actually no I think it's closer to 40,000 um, just in the city alone we have had to inflate population numbers to make the game playable um, so it's not entirely accurate to the uh, fic itself like in in the fic the wasteland is almost entirely depopulated like yeah it's hugely depopulated which that's mostly kind of a reflection of the games and the fact that they don't have big populations there because you just can't render that many models. Yeah, really. Um, I mostly tend to believe that every model you see is into representation of like five or ten people. And like, uh, in the story, New Appaloosa only has like a hundred people living there, probably. I don't think an exact number is ever said, but it, it's tiny. It's like the 
or actually I'm, I'm yeah but in uh the game it's in the mod actually it's it's got i believe i want to say like nine thousand population there though so that that is counting not just the city of new appaloosa but the land around it but mm. still that's usually where i like to think that most of the population is it's massively agrarian in a post-apocalyptic society like i wouldn't be surprised that every few like every mile or so you'll see a house with a small family eking out a couple of uh, plots of land yeah definitely um it, it's definitely more akin to like medieval europe than it is modern times um People don't live in city, big cities yet unless they're forced to as slaves or that's where their family has always been and there's not really a way out because maybe the exit is blocked by raiders or this is the best place they can live. Um, or alternatively, if they're really rich and have people supplying them food in the cities. Hmm. But yeah, uh, Tekel Doio brings up uh, population of the NCR has about 700,000 citizens. That's a big population right there. Yeah, that's incredibly large for in by wasteland standards. Like, I think in Old World Blues, they, it, since that's a couple years, it's a couple years uh, before New Vegas, I think the NCR has like 800,000 out of like 3 million total in the whole on the whole map mm. which is <clears throat> and then the next biggest slice is Caesar's Legion I imagine yeah we, and to control pretty much a third of the wasteland's population is it, it's like it's huge yeah it's, it's, it's huge but, uh, yes, unless there's uh, any more questions from the audience, we'll give them a few minutes to give them something to ask us anything. I think this is probably where we're going to end it for the night. All right. It's been uh, – thank you for having me on. You're more than welcome, and we'd like to have you on again at some point, ideally. But, yeah, let's yeah. just give them a couple minutes to maybe ask a question or two. Riveting conversation. Yeah, uh, we are truly the most socially blessed people in the world. All right, then. Uh, looks like there's no more questions. Uh, let's move on to the end of the show, then. So this has been post Apoc Horse Talk with your host, Galaegis and BG, and our guest tonight has been The Laundry. And until next time, keep your eyes trained in your gun in its holster, because you never know what the wasteland brings. And have a good night. <laughs>